There is something that is great fun when the lectionary offers a reading that is most usually heard in a context other than Sunday morning. The passage from 2 Corinthians that is assigned to this day is most commonly heard at services of witness to the resurrection. At a funeral, there are few words more appropriate than, so we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure, because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. When you hear those words in the context of the loss of one loved too much to be lost, there is an inherent comfort. For too many, death comes after a long and debilitating illness, an illness that brings deterioration and decline. In those cases, death comes not as an unwelcomed intruder, but as a longed-for friend. That's the place we usually hear these words. But on a Sunday morning, we can allow ourselves the freedom to listen with fresh ears and to look with clear eyes at what else might be being communicated. What else might be going on in this well-known passage of Scripture? As I read and reread our passage, the words that jumped off the page at me were these. For we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. Now how do you look at something that cannot be seen? How do you do that? It sounds impossible, and yet, there it is, right in the pages of Scripture, we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. Now, you might simply write this off as so much theological mumbo-jumbo. Many do. Some, like the Apostle Thomas, want to see with their eyes in order to believe. Some want signs and wonders and grand displays, miraculous displays that will help them believe. There are plenty of Missouri Christians who are perfectly willing to believe if someone will just show them. Some of my less believing friends and acquaintances will often say to me, where is the evidence of God's existence? Some will come on a little stronger and ask, usually in frustration, how can you believe in a God that allows, fill in the blank, something terrible to happen? Where is the proof of this loving God you're always talking about? The question is, how do we learn to see the invisible? Possibly the hardest step is an admission, even a confession. The admission is simply this, there is more to reality than meets the eye. I'll never forget the day in science class when we looked at things under a microscope and saw that the big things we could easily see were made up of smaller things that could not be seen. I remember taking the chlorophyll out of a leaf and then dyeing what was left and being able to see the cell walls of the leaf. I'm not sure anything was ever the same after that. The same thing happened when I first entertained the possibility that there was more to life than could be seen or touched or tasted or heard. We learn from our earliest days that there is more to life than can be seen. We learn that gravity exists even though we can't see it and that it has the power to draw us back down to the earth even as we take our first liberating steps from its power. We learn that there is oxygen all around us, even if we can't see it, and that we breathe it all day long. We learn that there are planets and stars and that are far beyond our sight, and there are some planets and some stars that we can only see with the help of advanced telescopes. 
Now this would be a great place for a Bigfoot reference, but I'll restrain myself. So the truth is, we do believe in things we cannot see. We simply choose to believe in some things that we can't see, and doubt and dismiss other things that we cannot see. The challenge is to improve our vision to begin seeing what cannot be seen with the sole use of our eyes. There's an old story of a disciple, or a disciple, his teacher. Where shall I find God? The disciple asked. Here, the teacher said. Then why can't I see God? Because you do not look. But what should I look for? The disciple continued. Nothing. Just look, the teacher said. But at what? Anything your eyes light upon, the teacher said. Must I look in some special kind of way? No. The ordinary way will do. But don't I always look the ordinary way? No, you don't, the teacher said. But why ever not, the disciple pressed. Because to look, you must be here. You're mostly somewhere else, the teacher said. And there's the challenge. You and I live in a world in which we are rarely present. Our world is filled with distractions. Some of us understand that only too well. Some of us, the preacher included, have a condition known as ADD. Do you know what that is? Attention deficit. Have you noticed we're redoing the archer window? <laughs> Disorder. Our awareness is easily sidetracked. Our focus is easily diverted. And when we try to see the things that are eternal, the invisible things, we get distracted by the things that are too easily seen. When seen in their truest context, these are the lesser things of life. And yet these are the things we pursue with such dogged determination and persistence that they become the very measure of our lives. We judge others and ourselves by what we have, by the amount in the bank or in our portfolio, by the kind of car we drive, by the vacations we take, by the restaurants we frequent, by the labels of the clothes we wear. And when we think we don't measure up to our neighbors, we either ratchet up our efforts or we deem ourselves to be failures. We laugh at the puppy or the kitten that can spend hours chasing its own tail, millions of hits on Facebook, until the day we sadly discover that we have spent our lifetime doing just that. Yet, if we could slow down, maybe even stop the life-draining pursuit of more, and begin to look at the world with the eyes of faith, we might begin to see more than we ever dreamed was possible. If we could focus for just a few moments a day on what really matters, we might discover that what we've been longing for, looking for, is all around us, silent, untapped, unrecognized. In what has come to be known as the Celtic version of Christianity, there are places and moments that are described as thin places or thin moments. In these places and moments, the distance between the physical and spiritual all but disappears, and we see with new clarity and hear with new purity the things of God. In such places and moments, in such events and instances, we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, 
what cannot be seen is eternal. In these thin moments, we see clearly the eternal, the spiritual, the mystical. And it is more real to us than anything we have ever experienced before. The founder of the Iona community, the Reverend Dr. George McLeod, wrote a famous prayer. Its words say, Invisible we see you, Christ, above us. With earthly eyes we see above us clouds or sunshine, gray or bright. But with the eye of faith we know you reign, instinct in the sun ray, speaking in the storm, warming and moving all creation. Christ above us. We do not see all things subject to you, but we know that man is made to rise, already exalted, already honored, even now our citizenship is in heaven. Christ above us, invisible we see you. Invisible we see you, Christ beneath us. With earthly eyes we see beneath us stones and dust and dross, fit subjects for the analyst's table. But with the eye of faith we know that you uphold. In you all things consist and hang together. The very atom is light energy. The grass is vibrant. The rock pulsates. All is in flux. Turn but a stone and an angel moves. Underneath are the everlasting arms. Unknowable we know you. Christ beneath us. Such are the words, the heartfelt words of one who has learned to see the invisible. Such are the words, the faith-filled words of one who has glimpsed the eternal in the midst of the temporary. Such are the words, the life-giving words of one who has laid aside the worrisome work of pursuing the temporary more and has placed oneself into the care and keeping of the eternal. Can we see the invisible? Oh yes, we can. But seeing the invisible comes at a price. It's not free. Seeing the invisible asks of us but one thing alone. It simply asks for everything. For the invisible will not accept any place in our lives but the first place. And when we give ourselves to that pursuit, we will see that in God all things consist and hang together. The very atom is light energy. The grass is vibrant. The rocks pulsate. All is in flux. Turn but a stone, and an angel moves. May we see the invisible. May we see the presence and reality of God. For now and evermore.